finish off talking a little bit about uh, C3PO, the benefits of that, then I'm going to bring up uh, Brian from Toronto Truth Seekers. He's going to uh, show you some of his handy Mark. Mark. Sorry, Brian. Oh, sorry, Brian. Uh, you pointed to him. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> where's, my, where's my cheat sheet? What's the guy's name? Mark. I'm getting confused now. Mark or Brian will come up. <laughs> <laughs> Mark or Brian. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, and uh, we're being called sovereign citizens. Have you heard that term? Yeah. Doesn't make much sense, does it? Personally, I don't use the term sovereign. I, I don't think of myself as sovereign. I've examined it. The problems that I have with that. I have no subjects. I have no land. If I try claiming I'm sovereign, I'm pretty much saying I'm king shit. <laughs> Plus, to a large degree, I try to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus never claimed that he was sovereign. He always pointed to God and claimed that God was sovereign. I don't want to be arguing with other people about who's sovereign and who's not. As far as I'm concerned, take it up with God. If you want to claim you're sovereign, go talk to the true sovereign. I'm just in my father's field, minding my business, and you can't tell me what to do. I think that's a much more powerful position to be in and to claim, because then you don't have to continually defend your claim of sovereignty. You can simply point out that Canada is a nation founded upon the principles and the belief, or the belief and the principles of the supremacy of God, and you say, no, God's sovereign, and we're all equal below him. I see a lot of people get in trouble when they start trying to argue that they're sovereign, and that they're on the same level as the queen or whatever else. If you look at the whole history of it, and you go back thousands of years, the reasons that we even have these people calling themselves sovereign is because they were essentially insane, and they had a group of people that they wanted to bully, and they wanted them to follow them. There was a, another neighboring tribe with a, a, another similarly insane psychopath, and so the tribe needed to find the craziest guy in their group in order to take on the group on the other side, and they claimed that they had divine right. So unless you're willing to claim that you have some form of divine power to govern your fellow man, I would strongly suggest avoid even making the claim that you're sovereign. Let God be sovereign in, in my book. I think that's a much more powerful perspective to be in. And I think from that perspective, the people who try to claim that the queen is sovereign, what's she going to do? Say she had more power than, than God? I think we win at that point. Now, the Canadian Common Corps of Peace Officers, we're not trying to establish a, a war with the police. To a large degree, I'd like to share with you a little a, a mind movie that I had once. I get these little visions just as I'm falling asleep. And it's kind of like my subconscious is working on, on a process or a question, and then just as I'm about to fall asleep, I get this image in my mind that explains to me what my, my subconscious has been working on. And I had this little image and it was a series of cop shoes all towing the line. And I was inspecting all these shoes, and I'm wearing sandals, and I'm inspecting all the boots. And I see a boot that's across the line, so I kick the boot, and the boot goes back across the line. And I carry forth, and I see a muddy boot, and I kick the muddy boot, and it comes and it stomps on my foot. And then I look around, and it was like we were in a big dance, and I couldn't see any anyone's heads. It was just like views from here down. But I noticed that we were in a dance, all these boots are facing in, and all of the people who are dancing are wearing sandals, but they all have boots around their neck that they could put on at any time. And so I stamped my other foot three times. And then at that point, the music stopped, and all of the people turned around, and they paid attention to what's happening on the line there, and they started taking off their boots. And at that point, all of the cops that we were inspecting, you know, they ended up taking a step across the line, turning around and towing the, the line from the other side and expanding the dance out. What we want to do is expand the dance. We, they're trying to constrict it. They're trying on a daily basis. They're creating more and more regulations and orders and, and bylaws and all sorts of crap that we're supposed to understand. But even they can't understand it all and yet we're liable to it. Our goal must be to get those police officers to recognize that their duty is to the dance. It is to us, and they should have their back to us and be looking out, not trying to squeeze us in and, and condense us in. By us recognizing that we have our own boots, we do not have to dance to their tune, we don't have to wear our sandals of peace, we have our boots too, and we outnumber them 900 to 1. We win. 
that's the, what I see anyways. So with the Canadian Common Corps of Peace Officers, uh, Barb's a peace officer. Barb, she's a peace officer. Anyone can do it. We can hire each other to be peace officers. Now, once we do that, we can't just go forward and say, oh, we're peace officers, we're a bunch of yahoos, we're going to go and arrest cops. We would lose in the public arena very, very quickly. There has to be a certain amount of community and public oversight over it. We have to have, uh, once we have our peace officers, we have to elect from within ourselves a group to, as oversight. We also have to uh, appoint and then maybe elect at some point in the future civilian oversight so that our group is in fact governed by the populace directly. Then we are in a position as peace officers where we can go and police the police. And until we do that, and unless we do that, I am in deep fear for our country and the way that the trends are happening because the rights are being eroded very, very rapidly. And we have to do something about it. If we don't, there's going to come a day, I fear, where our grandparents or our grandkids will ask us, what did you do to stop this police state, this Nazi state? Didn't you see it coming? Why didn't you do anything? We will have no excuse. We will have no excuse whatsoever. We've seen the history of how they operated in, in, the, in Germany during World War II. We know what the end result is. We have absolutely no excuse for not standing against these people and doing so with the strength of our faith and on our character. And here's the thing. There are people who have found a great deal of remedy by pointing to the teachings of Jesus Christ. I personally use that to shut down courts repeatedly. The guy knew the law. But you don't, it's not a religious remedy. You don't have to believe so much in Jesus. This guy did what he did because he latched on to the belief in his heart and he held on to it and he said, no, you're wrong, I'm right, and I don't care what you do to me. Kill me. I don't care. I'm still right. His strength and his own faith and his own conscience and his willingness to follow that is what brought down the, the, Roman, the Roman Empire. From there it started to crumble. We have that power too. You don't necessarily have to be Christian. Whatever your faith is, whatever your belief is, you can do this just believing in love. Clint Mitchell, he did it. He said, no, I don't believe in Jesus as a, as a God. He's just my brother. And when he used it, he didn't mention Jesus Christ at all. And yet, the love in his heart is what won the day. It doesn't hurt to say that you follow the teachings of Jesus, but nor is it necessary. And if anyone comes to you and says, here's the Bible, and this is your only remedy, back away slowly. <laughs> it's not the case. The way I figure it, God has the power, and the words that he caused someone else to write, some dead man wrote those words thousands of years ago, because God wrote on his heart, and now people want to interpret those words for me. But if God is that powerful, which I believe he is, he can write on our hearts directly. Mm -hmm. And if he does that, I'm not looking at some thousand-year-old words or two thousand-year-old words, who knows who wrote them, when he can talk to me directly by just touching my conscience or my faith. Now I feel it coming on. Do, do, do. <laughs> okay, so we're going to bring up David Mark Anthony here. He's going to share with you his uh, his little, uh, well, not little, but this guy, from what I understand, is a, an ass kicker when it comes to understanding the swap. And uh, he's going to bring his own perspective to it. So please, a round, round of applause. Please. Society that we find ourselves 
Um, I understand that I can drive around with no license plate. Um, I also understand I'm going to spend a lot of time getting pulled over <laughs> and trying to explain stuff to cops who don't understand what's going on. So I drive with a license plate on my car and the vehicle's registered to a corporate fiction. Um, because I don't maintain a name. And if you're driving a car that's registered to a name, you don't maintain that. It, it, it doesn't work. You can't, you can't maintain the position that you're not the name if you're driving something that's registered to your name. So I keep my vehicle registered to a corporate fiction, and these are the only identity documents that I carry. And I've had occasion to produce them to cops who wanted to give me tickets and stuff. And well, they had to let me go. So I'm just going to share that experience I, re I recently had this year with the York Regional who, well, when he pulled me over, he said, what's your hurry? And I just looked at him and he said, you just ran a red light. He said, did I? I didn't admit to anything. I just asked him a question, did I? And to that, he just said, okay, well, do you have a driver's license? I said, no, no, why would I want one of those? And we got this. <laughs> okay, I need license registration and insurance. And I just looked at it and I said, I'm ineligible for those benefits. And they got a puzzled look and he said, are there any documents in this car? Do you have any ID? And I said, well, yeah. And I reached over and I handed him my statement of birth. He looked at it. And he said, I need license, registration, insurance. I said, there is none. And I opened the glove box and said, look, there's nothing. There's, 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 no, there's, no, there's no documents in this car. He said, is this car insured? I said, well, I presume so. <laughs> I told you it's not mine. He said, well, whose is it? Registered to a corporation. He said, Well, who's corporation? Who owns the corporation? That's what he asked me. He said, Who owns the corporation? And I said, I don't understand the question. Do you want to know who the class A and the class B shareholders are? Do you want to know who's the director and who's the president? I mean, it's a corporation. And that's, that's when he gave up there. And uh, he took my statement of bird and he stomped off back to his vehicle. And, uh, after a little while, he came back and he walked around the back because he wanted to see if there was a sticker on my plate, I guess. And then he came back and he said, today's your lucky day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it can't be bad. I can use a little luck. <laughs> he said, today's your lucky day because running a red light, no insurance, no registration, and no driver's license, that's at least $700 in fines. I don't know where the hell he got that number, because to the best of my knowledge and belief, driving with no insurance is like a $5,000 fine, isn't it? Something like that. But anyways, he had this number, $700, and he, he said, uh, he wagged his finger at me. And he said, don't do that again. <laughs> So I said, may I have my document back? He said, oh, I gave you that. I said, no, you didn't. And he said, are you sure? I said, absolutely. So he went back to his vehicle. I mean, it's not like it's a driver's license that he could have done on his dashboard. It's a big, like, yellow thing. How could he not know he had that? But I realized that he was probably trying to take, keep my document because he understood that if I drove away with that, this was what was protecting me. And if I drove away without it, he could have easily. I was not young and 16. I was in the middle of Richmond Hill. There's cops everywhere. He could have, could have had me pulled over. But anyways, he, uh, he went back to his vehicle and he retrieved this document off his seat. And as he came and handed it back to me, he did this again. He said, don't do that again. So I took my document and 
and I, I drove away without saying anything to my cousin who was in the <laughs> So this is a document I carry. It's a statement of birth. Uh, we've uploaded YouTube videos trying to share this information. You can get these from 777 Bay Street. Actually, you I, can't know. They, they moved it up to 407. I was, I was just Shepherd. about to say that. I was there two weeks ago on behalf of a friend. And uh, Ryan just informed me this morning when I was speaking to him that it's been moved up to 47 Shepherd. 47. Now, 47 Shepherd, you have Shepherd, there's a small east or west? place. Oh, that's the there. Park. It's, it's down south, half a block uh, east of Young, it's on the park. south side of Shepherd, is where that courthouse is. I don't, I don't know why. We've been sending a lot of people down to 777 Bay Street, and uh, I guess they've become annoyed with us, so they moved it up there. But I have this statement of birth, which I have notarized and authenticated. Here's the only other documents that I carry, and I seem to be able to navigate around quite well with these. Um, oh, this is cool. I like to get all my notarized documents authenticated, because we're, that's an official document. Yeah. And it's more money, too. <laughs> yeah, but... There. This is, uh, this is a page out of the police officer's manual. I got it notarized, and then I got it authenticated, so it's, it's truth. And what we have here is on page 520 of the Police Officer's Manual of Criminal Offenses and Criminal Law, we have the word person. And I'll dispense with all the, here's, here's the, the critical piece of information it says. The only person known to our law is the corporation. So if you're identifying yourself with government-issued documents, a driver's license, you're identifying yourself as a corporation and you are known to their law. If you're identifying yourself as a living soul and you're not using the issued documents that Rob was talking about earlier, then you're not known to their law. They basically have corporate bylaws. We all know Canada's corporation, the person's a corporation, and they've got all these corporate bylaws because corporations don't exist only on paper. They're not real. And so they can't observe these common law laws. They don't, they don't see them. And so they've introduced these corporate bylaws, and, and that's in essence what they are. So that's good when you can show a cop, look, this is your manual. And this is what it says about a person. Here's another document I have. It's on the letterhead of the Registrar General. And the Registrar General are the people who maintain the birth records and they issue your statement of birth. And this is a letter on their letterhead. And it simply says, to be clear, the Office of the Registrar General registers information about events. The Office of the Registrar General does not register people. And that's very significant. It's very significant when you understand what that means. And then, here's a good fake notice in case I don't feel like talking to a cop. I can just put this through my window and hand it to him. And it says, it's got the stamp of the Registrar General, it's got her signature on it. And it's notarized and it's authenticated and it just says, with all due respect, officer, I do not maintain the name of any person in your jurisdiction. I am not entitled to any rights to any documents of identification you may seek by license. I provide you in good faith who maintains the birth name I am a recipient of and beneficiary protected by your higher powers. And his higher power is the Deputy Registrar General, who's named on the birth certificate. And that's what I allude to when I, I say I provide you in good faith who maintains the name. Judith M. Hartman, the Deputy Registrar General, maintains the name. I'm not in charge of it. I don't have signing authority for it. And then lastly, it just says, below, I humbly and peacefully provide you proof so certified 
under the Vital Statistics Act. Uh, 46.1, who has signing authority for the birth name which protects me as a witness? And uh, that's what I like to carry. It's very effective and it works. And uh, if anyone wants to ask me a question, I'll be happy to answer. Um, so you basically do contracting with police officers? Is that in the form of commerce or no? I, I, no, I choose not to engage. So that, that shows the paperwork you give them? Well, this allows me, to... see if a cop asks you for ID and you're not carrying any government issued ID, well, you can put yourself in a position where you're failing to identify yourself. The cop can maintain that you're failing to identify yourself by not producing ID. I'm identifying myself. By giving up. There's a distinction, there's a very important distinction on the statement of birth that exists here and not on the birth certificate. It says surname and it says given name. And they're on two separate lines and there's a clear distinction made between given name and surname. Now if you look at the birth certificate, it says name. And it's got them both blended together as one. It's a trade name. It's a corporate, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trade name. And when you use that government issued ID, you're identifying yourself as the trade name. So if I'm asked to identify myself, and the facts so certified confirm what I'm about to say, I say, someone asked me my name, a judge, state your name for the record, a cop, what's your name? My given name is Mark. What's your last name? Only corporations have last names, human beings have titles. And I don't have a last name, and so I just say, my given name is Mark. What's your last name? Well, that name was not given to me. I can only give that which is mine. My given name is Mark. That name was given to me. I can give that to you. The surname that you may see, it's shared by a group of people known to me as my family, but it's not mine, it wasn't given to me, and therefore I cannot give that which is not mine. And if you don't willingly consent to surrendering the surname, they can't establish jurisdiction. Period. I can't, I can't say for 100% certain, but I looked into, um, I have, in my possession, my great great grandmother's um, certificate of baptism okay. from England from like, it was like 1850. Yeah. That's the exact same thing. It said uh, given name and then family name. Mm -hmm. So again, it would just be me assuming, but I would, I would, it's a good guess that the statement of birth is actually a secular form of a statement of baptism. Well, you're without, exactly. without attaching, so you're not you're not into the birth certificate realm. You're just well, that's a document that's stating this person was born or this individual was born on this date. It's really just a well. You're exactly right. Baptismal records and family bibles yeah. are the two forms of identity that are legally accepted without a birth certificate. Yeah. Birth certificate. See, the data off of here is transposed onto the birth certificate yeah. and register. Yeah. And the word register in law means to abandon. Yeah. Yeah. So how many different set of documents do you carry with you and what are the names of them? Well, this is, well, the reason why I have two of these, oh, this is something very cool. I just did two weeks ago. I drove to Ottawa. When I get documents notarized, I always get like 10 of each. So I have lots, and that way I don't have to worry about sacrificing one to a court or to a or whatever. So these are the same documents. The distinction, I went to the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade in Ottawa two weeks ago. And this is now a passport. Passports. I can use this to passport, and when I was at Service Canada and said to the woman there, this document's a passport, isn't it? And she said, yeah. Without hesitation, she said, yeah. 
I've got to look into this more. So a year has gone by, and I found out some more stuff, and I ended up at, at the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ottawa. There's not one in Toronto. But if you go there, they have a process called uh, legalized. They, this document is now legalized. That's their terminology. Uh, you bring over documents, you can take up to 10 at one time, and they stamp them. They confirm that the notary is authentic and that it's a true document, and they stamp it. And what it says is that uh, the Canadian Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and International Trade, trade means commerce, right? International Trade has authenticated the foregoing uh, document and signature. And then they put, there's two autographs on that, and then they put another stamp on it that says Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. So you go there, it's like a Hungarian delicatessen, you take a number, they start at about 10 a.m., and they start calling people in. And mostly it's lawyers who are getting like death certificates legalized because they're executing estates and, and stuff like that. There's not too many weirdos like me there. And uh, you can take up to 10 at a time. It took me four hours to drive to Ottawa and four hours to drive back, and so I figured, well, I'm there for the day anyway. So I took 10 in the morning, I went and had lunch, I went back in the afternoon, took another number, and I got another 10. What I did was in the morning, I got 10 of these done, and then in the afternoon, I went back with uh, the valuable token, so their terminology for the short form birth certificate. The one with Tyson? Bond. They, their terminology for that is a valuable token. And it is valuable if you know how to use it. And so I got 10 of them stamped for trade at the Department of Foreign Affairs. And uh, so I'm just about to start using them to see what because if, uh, if they work the way I think they're going to, I'll have some very interesting news to report um, and we'll upload it to YouTube so that everyone can see it. But who's got another question? So, so basically you're saying you only really have one document? Because <laughs> that's my question, was, well, what, how many documents do you carry and what, what's the need to them? Well, the only one I need, I feel I need to carry, is the statement of birth. The statement of birth. My identity. And then after you went through certain process, it, had, it gains more, I guess, quote-unquote power. Well, no, more. I just like to carry more because I can and it doesn't hurt. No, I mean, after you went through the four years, it now also became a passport as well. And oh, that oh, okay, you go, yeah, now with this, if I go to uh, the American Embassy with this document, say I'm going to passport, I'm traveling on this day, this time, these are the, this is the document of identity that I will be using, and you get the uh, American Embassy to stamp it, right beside where the Canadian Foreign Affairs is stamping. Now it's both, it's been recognized by both governments. The border guards are irrelevant. So basically you have to get that done at any country's embassy around here that you're planning to travel to. Yeah, so you this, can leave that country with a picture ID and get on the plane. What, when I do this, I'm going to have a camera on me and I'm going to film it. Because I know no one no will believe me. First yeah, no and secondly, I just want evidence and information that I can share. So Are you planning to fly or cross like the bridge? Uh, if you want to stay. Both. Yeah, try flying. Yeah. 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 So we'll see what happens. Do you, do you, uh, you have a document right to travel for driving? Is that what you use also for right to, your basic right to travel while you drive? <laughs> oh, I drive a lot. I drive like... You know? Do you have a document in case you get stopped? Do you use a right to travel document? What do you use? Just your life birth? Are you talking about time to give it a truth? So you don't even like consent to even reason with cops, talk to them, you're not bargaining with them. You just show them, I'm not a corporation, <coughs> done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have time for two more questions. Can you, uh, can you please explain what the first one you came into existence to why? Well, 
Over a span of about 30 years, they were actually introduced finally by, uh, I believe it was 33, everyone who was born. Um, Got sold to the government. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, the very first ones, from the best I've been able to ascertain, the, in the late 1800s, they started issuing them. But uh, prior to that, uh, baptismal records, as our friend mentioned, or the family Bible is where birth records were kept. Um, was it around the same time as the Federal Reserve was created? Well, the Federal Reserve Act was passed in 1913. See? The, in 33, there was a bankruptcy. All the Commonwealth nations, uh, Canada, States, New Zealand, uh, England, and all the other Commonwealth nations, there was, there was a bankruptcy. And the, the international bankers came in and said, okay, well, we have a mechanism whereby you can continue to conduct commerce even though there's no money. Pledge your citizens as collateral. And that's, and that's why First Clifton is worth money. It's a bond worth the... Well, there is there is no money. There's debt and there's credit. And you can use credit to offset debt. But in reality, no bills can be paid because there is no money. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we got one more question. One more question. What's this corporate entity you say? If you don't have a driver's license or anything, but you said your car is registered under your corporate entity. Yeah. Right? Are you a free man? You have a first name I'm but no last soul. name. Okay, so then what's the corporate entity? John Todd Legal Services. Just make anything up you want to. Fifteen hundred bucks. Oh no, 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 no. It cost me hundred and eighty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> They're creating corporate fictions. The point of you is the trustee and tricking you into thinking that you're in reality the corporate fictions and you're not. So I have no problem creating corporate fictions and registering vehicles. <laughs> Well, that's awfully fascinating. Thanks, Mark. We should uh, we should talk later. Maybe we can. Uh, well, I certainly want copies, anyways. <laughs> Folks, one of the things we're doing here is not just sharing our information with you. We are giving you an opportunity to meet other like-minded people, to connect, to network. That's one of the key things about this. We are we have moral right on our side, but the other side is so much better organized. <laughs> So unless we start organizing a little bit along that lines, uh, we're going to find ourselves on the, on the losing end of it. I have a couple of things here which we'll pass around later. People can read them. I wanted to get a bunch of copies made. One is the hatchet job from the National Post, where uh, they refer to us as uh, not openly racist. And I wanted to read to you what one sergeant from the uh, Hamilton Police Services had to say. Now bear in mind, after I read this, I called po professional standards in, uh, in the Hamilton Police Services, and I spoke with a sergeant there. He wanted to just brush it off. He said, well, our officers have the right of free speech. And I said, well, yeah, but in the Criminal Code of Canada, there's a little thing called uh, defamatory libel, which does limit free speech to a certain degree. And this, these were the words spoken by a sergeant in the hate crimes unit of the, uh, the, the Hamilton Police Services. He says, he said, nobody should be fooled by free man beliefs. Sometimes you wonder if we're walking on the same planet. Have they gone off the edge? The criminal code is for all Canadians, and the emphasis is on all. They can't step outside the law because the law applies to them. If the law is broken, then that will be dealt with under the law. Now, I tried talking to the professional standards cop about it, and he just tried to give me a brush off. 
bearing in mind that I'm a peace officer, I told him, listen, if you just if you refuse to do your job, I have no problem going before a judge as a peace officer, swearing out an information, securing an arrest warrant for that cop, and executing that warrant all by myself. Do I have your attention yet? And he was like, uh, yeah, you got my attention now. So he said, uh, he said he'd go read it. He calls me back the next day. And he said, I'd like you to write your concerns down, put them on paper, and send them to me, and we're going to deal with it. Because you can't have my argument, the letter that I'm writing to him, I can defend my beliefs in a court of law. There are a lot of people out there who believe some stuff which is right off the chart. I mean, Scientologists, for instance, believe that Nuremberg dropped, who knows what they believe, really. <laughs> but they've got a right to believe it, and they've got a right to believe it without a, a cop in the hate crimes unit coming down on them and saying, oh, I've got to wonder what, what planet they're on. So my concern is that we have that right. The other one that I have is a, uh, it's a, a much more balanced uh, journalistic endeavor. The Freeman on the Land Movement, Grassroots Libertarianism in Action by Professor John Kiersey. Uh, Freeman on the Land is taken off across the globe. Who here is aware of what's happening in New Zealand? They have had a completely successful bloodless revolution. It happened uh, a couple of years ago. What was happening? Uh, developers were coming into New Zealand and going to the Maori people and offering them a ludicrous amount of money for their land knowing that they wouldn't sell. It's a dishonor to sell your land there. You have to pass it on to your, to your, your offspring. So they'd offer more money than the land is worth. That would shoot their tax rate up through the roof. They couldn't afford it. They would get evicted from their, their territory. And then the developer was coming in and buying it at a lower rate, at the right rate. It was a big scam between the developers and the municipal government. So this one guy, 22-year-old kid or somewhere around there, a uh, wife and a couple of kids, he decides to go out on common land, what we call crown, crown land, and he builds himself a little home. Neither did the developers nor the municipality like that too much. They took him to court. The judge ordered him, tear down your house within 30 days, you're going to jail for nine months. The guy at that point contacted a friend of mine. I helped him set up a claim of right, read the, uh, the New Zealand's Crimes Act. He goes back into court 30 days later. He hasn't torn down his house. The judge says, you better have a damn good reason for not tearing down your house uh, as per my order or I'm going to throw you in jail. Guy says, I do. Here you go. That's my property. I'm holding it under a claim of right. According to the New Zealand Crimes Act, I can do that and I can refuse to accept any orders. It's essentially the same right we have here to hold property under a claim of right, even against all of the powers of the state. You can just tell them, screw you. No, it's mine. I'm holding it. He then pointed out to the judge that theft, according to the New Zealand Crimes Act, was the removal of property without a claim of right, pointed out neither the judge nor any of his officers had one, so they were actually committing theft. At this point, the judge overturned his own order, said, no, I'm out of here, and then he let the guy keep his land. That went through the Maori population like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> oh, they're a tight-knit community. Before you know it, everyone's holding their property under a claim of right. They're all refusing now to vote and transfer authority. And under the United Nations, you have a right to directly participate in the decision making within your community, you don't have to elect people like we do. So now what they've had, instead of having elected government, they have direct government. Where when there are issues to be decided, they get together and vote on it themselves because they don't trust anyone anymore to go do that for them. The claim of right was used in New Zealand by these guys who went and caused $8 million worth of damage to a, uh, a NATO or a U.S. Uh, radar installation. They've got these great big Teflon balloons, inflated things covering them. They went and sliced that open and destroyed uh, eight million bucks worth of property. They used a claim of right as a defense and they claimed that they had a duty to do so and they had a right to do so to protect their country from the states and the courts upheld that. Now the people in the New Zealand government are shit and they have no idea how to deal with a claim of right where essentially all you're doing is you're telling the people in the government, listen, you're just a human being, I'm a human being, we're in a common law jurisdiction, we're equal, you need my consent and I'm not giving it to you, so go away, stop treating me like I'm your child or your ward. And it's working. It's working in a very big way. It's also not working to a large degree for a lot of people and I'll tell you why.
A claim of right is not a license. We've been conditioned where you get a license and you think, oh, all you have to do is show the cop and now he can't touch you. A claim of right doesn't work like that. A claim of right is a line in the sand and you say, if you cross this line, we're going to have to fight and the liability is all yours. Now, if they cross that line to test you and you go, oh, you crossed my line, it doesn't work. <laughs> They know you're a faker. They know that your claim of right is not supported. You know who it does work for? People who know that if you cross that line, ha, get that, pal. If they recognize that you do, in fact, have a fighting spirit, if you are the kind of human being who's just going to keep at it, keep at it, and you know you're right, then they recognize that. The people I know who've used a claim of right successfully are those people who, when they say, don't cross this line unless you want to fight me, these are people who, if you cross that line, you will be fighting them. There's no, oh, now I'm going to go cry to someone because you crossed my line. It's not a line they can't cross. It's a challenge to them. It's a line they can't cross without accepting liability. But if you just fold at that, then they win. So if you're going to use a claim of right and you're drawing a line in the sand, make sure you are, in fact, willing to bring some sort of action to bear if they do. That's why it's important to work together as a group to establish some form of community within our, our own ranks so that if someone does get pulled over and the cops come try, you get on your phone and you call your friends and you've got cars showing up with video cameras and maybe you get, uh, we get to the point where we have peace officers and you can start doing that as well. So you've got someone there with a video camera uh, in, uh, monitoring everything that they do. Now, one of the reasons I came out here to Ontario was, in fact, to initiate a certain amount of legal action. What's that? We're the lamest province of all. <laughs> you haven't ever been to Saskatchewan, have you? <laughs> One of the things we're doing, I've got some legal action that I bring into bear in the Superior Court, and what I'm looking for is a judicial determination. Now we know we're right, but the cops, they don't give a shit really, and they're just engaging in whatever action they want until someone tells them to stop. So recognizing that there's a potential for a problem, what I'm doing is we're going into court and we're going to ask for a judicial determination on four simple points. Now the trick to it is you have to bring it, you have to ask them a question that's yes or no, not what is your opinion, do we have this right? So the first issue is the right to travel. Do we or do we not have the right to get out on the road and without permit or license travel from point A to point B? You can't go ask them that question though because then they'll read the whole Highway Traffic Act and they give you a great big runaround. You've got to nail them right down to it. So the question we're asking the court is, can you show us a section in the Highway Traffic Act that clearly, specifically, and unequivocally remove the previously existing right. It's got to be right there. They can't claim that this body of words has removed a right if it doesn't even mention the right. It, if it wants to claim it affected that right, it must do so clearly, specifically, and unequivocally. Otherwise, acts which mention no rights would have the effect of removing all rights. So fundamentally, if they want to claim an act has affected a right, they have a duty to be able to point out where in that act that right is even mentioned first. Do a little search, a word search on the Highway Traffic Act, the common law right to travel is not mentioned. It's not affected at all. So what we ask the judge, can you find a section that says this? No? Fine. Here's what we want. We want an injunction barring the cops from enforcing the Highway Traffic Act in a manner which contravenes the criminal code. Because when they, when they stop you from traveling, it's mischief. So at this point in time, now the judge, he's going to be in a difficult position. They make a lot of money off this little scheme. But if they can't point out exactly where it is, if they try giving a big runaround, we get to look at them and say, listen, pal, you are eroding the public's trust and faith in your justice system by trying to give us a runaround. We know what we can read. Show us the section or admit it doesn't exist. Don't try telling us that the intent of Parliament or the intent of the legislature was to remove the right which they don't even mention. Secondly, by putting them on the spot, they have to either publicly say cops are bound by the criminal code or they have to publicly say cops are above the law. They can't do that. It's political suicide. The second one we're looking at 
and this is kind of just to spank the courts a little bit, we're asking a question about whether or not the courts require the consent of both parties to the adjudication prior to the adjudication process. They're not going to like that. I've heard publicly, in person, I asked Beverly McLaughlin, the Supreme Court Justice, of, or the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, I asked her whether or not, how we can determine whether or not what we're receiving is a benefit if when we, in order to receive that benefit, we have to abandon rights and we don't even know what rights those are. Her response was, didn't answer the question, but she said, since Canada is a common law jurisdiction where equality is paramount and mandatory, no one can provide adjudication services without the consent of both parties to the adjudication. So I'm asking the judge to publicly acknowledge that. And if he fails to do so, he has to publicly claim that he has the power and the right somehow to govern his fellow man even without the consent of, those, of that fellow man, that he can impose his will. Now he's not going to like that because if he tries doing that, it's political suicide, so he has to answer. I intend to win a bet with that one. The third one that we're going to be asking about is whether or not the Criminal Code of Canada acknowledges that a peace officer is any person hired to preserve and maintain the public peace. And if he says yes, now bear in mind I'm doing this not just for our benefit, I know the answers. He knows the answers. The cops know the answers, but until they hear a judge says it, they're just going to do what they do. So what I'm going to do is get them to admit that we do in fact have the power to hire peace officers, and again, existing policy enforcement officers are bound by the Criminal Code of Canada, and we can bring action to bear against them. We can, we can arrest them. The final question that we're asking the court is whether or not the Criminal Code of Canada, Section 3839, mentions and uh, describes the powers that we have if we are holding property under a claim of right. We can hold that property and if someone who even someone who thinks they have a legal right to it, we can tell them, screw you, I'm going to use whatever level of force or violence is necessary to stop you from taking my property. So the question is, can, does this apply during interactions between us and government agents or are they above the criminal code, are they above the law? So the judge has to, I'm uh, trying to put him in a position where he has to acknowledge cops aren't above the law, therefore this is applicable, yes. The end result, my goal, is to be traveling down the highway in my own privately owned automobile. I'm hoping to buy it off these guys. You guys actually, if you're looking for vehicles, Barb and, Barb and her buddy over here, Dave, the guy that's the other guy to talk to. I told you I'd help you out there, buddy. <laughs> And they're going to know that if they try to stop me, that I am in fact a peace officer capable of arresting them for interfering, for uh, attempting to enforce the Highway Traffic Act in a manner that contravenes the criminal code, and that I can hold my property under a claim of right, and I don't care if they try pulling out a gun or dealing with a peace officer holding property under a claim of right. That's what I think is necessary and why a lot of people here in Ontario are having a bit of problems. Uh, when they're exercising these rights is they haven't taken the proper steps to disempower the cops so that they don't feel that they have a right to do what they're doing. Is the court date set? <clears throat> nope, I have not yet uh, put my documents in. I just got them done up. Um, where is Barb? Uh, there's no documents there printed up. Is the, did you print everything I sent you? Uh, there was one thing that didn't get printed up. I don't think. Oh. Um, I'm looking at filing those documents, what's today, Wednesday, Thursday, probably <coughs> next week. So you won't, you won't be back for another year. What's that? You won't be back for another year. No, no, I'm going to put... the system works, it takes like, so long to go through the... Yeah, I factored that in, I told them that you have three days to decide, or you can take as long as you want, but in the meantime, I'm exercising these rights. <laughs> so if they want to do the little delay game, I, I'm kind of ready for that. But I'm not waiting for them to say, okay, you can exercise your rights. I'm doing it until they tell me I can't. Right. And the fact that it's before the court means that the, the police officers can't come in and interfere. Otherwise, they're interfering with a justice system participant, which is contrary to the criminal code as well. <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's my show there. It's getting late. I know you guys have some questions. I'm hoping you don't. <laughs> <laughs>
Do you guys mind if we take another quick break? Because uh, I had coffee earlier and it's working now. <laughs> you want questions and answers? Yeah, I just want to know what ID do you use? Uh, the ID I used is a notary public's affidavit that has my picture on it. I'll actually show it to you later if you what want to. What do you to. mean, a, notar a notarized? It's a notary public's oh. affidavit. Oh, a notary public. That's something we have a hard time The answers are more of a come up with questions that no one else can answer kind of guy. Uh, I don't claim to have all the answers, so I'll do what I can for the next 15, 20 minutes or so, but it's getting tires. So, you in the back. What is it uh, that you want from us when you're doing this determination? Um, is there any support that we give you, or is it just... Uh, if we had gotten it printed up, there is a couple of things. Uh, it might cost some money to do it. I'm hoping that I can come up with the two, three hundred bucks it'll cost. Uh, I also have a form, and I don't want to go up there in front of the court and have them think that I'm a lone nut operating all by myself. Uh, so what I've got is a notice that people can sign under, and it says, we, the undersigned, uh, serve notice that we are aware of Rob Menard's legal uh, action seeking a judicial determination, and we support this. So that when I go in front of the judge, I can say, look, I'm not all alone. I've got 500 people from all across BC or all across Ontario who support this, this action. Uh, and that's about all I'd be looking for. Uh, other than that, I don't want anyone putting pressure on the courts or anything like that. But simply the court knowing that you're aware and that you're watching so that they don't try to pull any bull will do a whole lot. This might sound like a stupid question, but what, what's a notice of understanding? And what you need to, uh, a notice of understanding is essentially that. It's just a notice of what your understanding is. It leads to a claim of right. The goal is to establish a claim of right that empowers you to disobey the courts and the government. That will give you the lawful excuse. A claim of right gives you the lawful excuse to disobey, but your claim of right has to be based on a certain amount of understanding, a certain knowledge. So your notice of your understanding and your intent is a notice to them telling them what your understanding of the law is, which allows you to claim the rights that you're claiming. So you talk about just understanding of basic common law? Well, it's like a like the one I told you about with Clint Mitchell. His understanding was just what was in my art. It's my understanding love is my law. It's my understanding love isn't in your words. It's my understanding that your words aren't my law. Uh, my intent is to follow my law and claim the right to do so. So essentially what you're doing is you're trying to establish a situation which empowers you to do whatever you want. And it doesn't matter, uh, like say you're looking for a specific thing like a 96 is your fix to discharge any, any sort of demands. What you would do is you would establish a notice of, uh, you start with a notice of understanding stating that it's your understanding that the resources of the country belong to everyone, not just to the companies that are extracting them for profit. So you work your way through an understanding that allows you to claim the rights you're claiming. So do you discharge debt, become debt free, whatever, before you're free, or you go free and then discharge that? And also, <coughs> once you're debt free... One, one question at a time. All right. That um, per, I, I haven't done the process myself oh. because I don't get any bills like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, my rent and whatnot, is, it, all of that is covered. There are people in BC who are kicking butt with the 96 is your fix, discharging all sorts of, uh, like mostly hydro debts. Uh, but they start started with a claim of right to BC Hydro saying, we claim the right to the resources that you're extracting for profit, and we claim that you have a duty to, with your original agreement to give it to us for free before you go sell it to other people. And if that's not the case, we demand you give us a bill, a signed bill, so that someone is, is accepting liability for this demand. And no one there wanted to do it, and there's a bunch of people getting their, their hydro discharged from that in that manner. So if everybody from BC started doing that, what would happen? Uh, it's our water, and it's not like uh, they need the money anyways. They get bonuses of you know millions and millions of dollars. And uh, there was a guy in uh, his name's Warren. He's in Dawson Creek. He was doing this he, with great success, helping people discharge even mortgages. 
And when he told a buddy of his who's involved as a, uh, a chief executive officer of a fairly large corporation, it came out that these remittances that people send back with their checks do have financial worth and it formulates the bulk of their bonuses. <coughs> they get smaller bonuses. In, in Ontario, I think it might be slightly different. You would still have to start with a claim to the resources. This doesn't work with things like wind. You guys are getting all these wind farms. So you wouldn't be able to claim that the wind is yours. You could claim, however, that the people putting up these windmills need your permission one way or another because it's a great big eyesore and once they generate the hydro, uh, this is the argument being used in BC for uh, telecom, for discharging telecom, is that they run wires <coughs> which uh, uh, mar the, the sight lines and they need our permission just to run their wires. So I don't know that you could claim that the wind is yours, but you could probably claim that the people putting up the windmills have a duty to provide it. Uh, for free to the people who have to suffer with their windows. So you have to write all this stuff up in your notice of intent and understanding. Your notice of understanding, <laughs> yeah. It's my understanding, Air Canada is a public thing, so I can use it. My understanding that C and Rail yes. is a public You have to list whatever you plan on using to get around in your life. Yeah, and you, have to, you have to give them an opportunity once you express your intent. Bear in mind, just saying this is my understanding, this is my intent, doesn't stop it. You're now in a game where they have an opportunity to write back and say, sorry, your understanding is, is ludicrous. And you can't do that. They have to have that right. If they don't, that's when you, you continue through the process. And when you're done, you have at least established, it might not be the right to engage in an action, but you have the color of right to engage in that action. And that's a very powerful legal defense. Do you know anything about colorable law? Yes. Next question. <laughs> it's great. I'm sorry, do you have a more in depth? No, question? I'm sorry. Um, I, I was just recently taught that they use what's called one second. Um, but they, they use what's called the doctrine of color colorability. Color of law, yes. Yeah. It's not actual law, but it has the color of it. It looks like it. And so along the lines, of, a way of understanding it is a color of right. You might not have the right, but a color of right is a belief that you do have the right based upon situ uh, uh, circumstances which, although not true, if they were true, you would have that right. So, so they basically use the doctrine of colorability to change over, say, acts or do whatever they want to do to cover up and change up shit. That's what they do. I, well, but they use what, it. What Why they, do they use that word colorability? I don't understand. Because it's a it's a defense for their actions. They aren't claiming it's the law. They're claiming that it looks like the law from a distance, and therefore I'm not liable for enforcing it because it looks like it. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I didn't know. And that's their defense. And they use it with color of right, color of law, all the time. Is that like the noble law? I don't believe so. Okay, kind of technical, um, but with that whole anything you can, you say, kind of will be used against you in a law. Once you shut your trap, they take you to jail, they hand you the lawyer phone. At what point can you say something else without like, getting yourself in trouble? Uh, and that question, once you go like this, if they then say something else after that, that question is done. So you can then interact with them after that, and they, oh, you said something, yeah, but it wasn't in response to your question. You let them talk first. Yes. Okay. Sorry, when you do your signature or your autograph, do you use any, like, all rights reserved or anything like that, or do you just... I haven't signed, signed anything in so long. <laughs> really? Yeah. How the hell do you do that? Like, I get contracts mail to my home with my domicile all the time. They always want my autograph. They always want it. And I sign mine with all rights reserved because I am a Moorish American. So I was just wondering, do you use any kind of that. protection on that note or uh, if I am signing something I would likely say uh, all rights reserved if it's like a contract, if someone's forcing me to sign it, I, I put under duress, under protest and duress. Do you use CCs? No. Why? 
There is, it doesn't really exist in Canada. No, I know that. You yeah, end up looking kind of silly because you're pointing to documents that exist outside the jurisdiction and it simply identifies you as someone who doesn't really know what's happening here but, in Canada. But isn't the same, the same constitution for the USA the same constitution for Canada, Canada being a corporate number in that corporation? No. Not that I believe. One more. You know, you said earlier that in reality we don't really own anything. Um, so when you establish that became a right for property? And I don't believe I said that. When did I say that? Right at the beginning. That was someone else. Yeah, it wasn't me. <laughs> That's why I'm not giving you this. Right? <laughs> Although, uh, on that topic, I do believe that our attachment to material things is something that they use against us all the time. And when you look at it, you boil it down, my theory is, you can really only own that which you can carry while you're being chased by something that wants to eat you. That's what you really which truly Which is your contracts, own. which is your documents. Ask any, ask, ask any squirrel being chased by a fox. What's in his mouth, that's what he owns. The nuts in his mouth. <laughs> Question? Yeah, sorry, I just have one more. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Hey. Um, you can't decide to protest and duress, or if you decide sign just using a, a, just under duress, is that, is it, is that applicable? The purpose of under protest is you're, they're claiming that there's a contract and you have an obligation and your failure to sign is contravening that contract. The purpose, the reason protest works, essentially what you're doing is you're saying you claim there's a contract, I haven't seen it, I don't believe there is, but you're threatening me with violence if I don't perform against this imaginary magical contract. But that's the duress part. But why no, that, part? that's protest. What you're doing is you're reserving your right under the commercial law, where he has three days now to produce that, that contract. If he doesn't, now you have the power to create the contract which, was, which your actions were under. So duress is just saying, you know what, I'm not doing this consensually. I'm not consenting to do this. It's not voluntarily. You're, you're threatening me. Protest reserves your right to create a contract after the fact once you've served it. Uh, just a little bit of a, a long-winded question. I, before I uh, learned about your work, I, I've actually been traveling to China for about seven years, and I, I work in China, so I had the opportunity to learn the Chinese language. And when I learned the Chinese language, I realized that it's a lot different than English. In the fact that they really don't ask questions. Everybody in China will make a statement. They'll say blah 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 blah. blah. And just to give you an example, if you're going to ask a woman to marry you, you don't ask her. You say, you will marry me. And if she doesn't like that, she will say, no. Then I got onto your, your work, and I, and I found that the English language is actually kind of, um, so it's a little bit confusing because we always ask everything. Ask stuff of police officers, ask stuff of judges, ask stuff of everybody. And then if they, if they say no, we feel all rejected. But if we were to make statements, like you said, with your under the notes of understanding. When you make a statement, that, that really is what you've done. They have the opportunity to come back and say, no, that's that's not right. But then you also have the opportunity to go back on, on, on them. It can become sort of an endless process. The question I have is my dad, he's filed his notice and his claim for it. He has a sm not, not much, but a small piece of property that he wanted to claim as his own. The problem became who did he send it to? He sent it to like he CC'd everybody, Governor General, Prime Minister, everybody. They all came back, reject, 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 reject. So I had a I had an idea and I wondered if, if this would sort of work into your philosophy, but I know if when you present evidence in a court of law, it can't just be any old evidence, because that's what he pointed to. He would go to you like, hey look, I sent this letter, I sent this letter, I sent this letter, and the judges would just look like this. They didn't see. They didn't see his letter. They wouldn't even look at it. And so I started doing some research into the evidence act, like what can we present as evidence? And is this the question? Leading up to the question, is he did it all on one breath? Would it be better off? Because 
in the evidence act they said you can present anything that's been that's been notified in the Canada is that would it be a better idea to actually write because anybody can advertise in, in the Canada is that with your fifty dollar fee. Or it was much more than that. I looked into it. You have to like a full claim of right, it is the ideal way to do it. Yeah. Um, but it has to be in French <laughs> and English. Yeah. And you have to publish it, I believe, three times. Yeah. And it's it, it, you'd be looking at a couple thousand bucks per publishing. Uh, would that not be what you need to say? You know what? Yeah, that's one way to do it. Um, <coughs> yeah, if your dad's got the money and the wherewithal, I would suggest <coughs> publishing it in the. In the but they can't the then ignore it. What's that? They cannot then ignore it. A judge can't no. really ignore it because he's supposed even, to know. He it. should even be ignoring it now. I know in BC, if they tried doing that, I'd pull out the Law and Equity Act and I'd start banging their bench with that. <laughs> So Next. The, just want to ask about letters. Uh, what is a letter derogatory? I just hear references to that. Uh, we have to look it up, I believe. I think it's called a letter derogatory. Yeah, well, I heard letters derogatory. Okay, let, uh, as far as I know, letter derogatory means that you are telling the lawyer what you want them to do, not what they're advising you to do. Uh, okay. I, because you're hiring them. Are you sure on that? I'm not sure on that. I'd have to look it up. I've heard it before, but it was, it's not in my brain right now. I just, I just <laughs> want to deny it. It, it might be something along that lines, uh, but I, I, I can't say either way. I think that her explanation makes sense because rogue uh, is, the rogue means I'm asking you in Romanian, which is based in Latin. So, Tamugat uh, means I asked you. So, that might be based on Latin derogatory. It, it sounds like that is probably. That was had something to do with one court community to another, but I mean, any, right? A person, a man can do other things. I think that's what it is. And now that you're ringing my bell, I think it's letters from one court to another asking them to either provide information or asking them to accept information that is being provided as a courtesy. I, I, yeah, I think it's from one court to another, and it's a, I think the term courtesy will be found in there. It doesn't create any obligation on the court, if I recall correctly, uh, but it is generally a, a courtesy from one court to another. Because I just heard uh, Andy Harris talking about it, it's heard about the letters derogatory, like I was wondering why. I think it's letters from one court to another, now that you're, you're pushing the uh, memory button. Yeah. And the reason he'd want you to do that is so that I believe what he was uh, addressing there was you hold your own court, you then craft letters rogatory, and you submit it to that court that you're with so that they have to look at this document uh, and give it a certain amount of validity. Because you wanted to uh, bring in du jour court, yeah. and because we have de facto courts, and would that be used to communicate? Between those courts, and the courts, the de courts, and, and, and the courts. No, I think the de jure court, the purpose, what I see with the de jure court, I don't even know that we'll actually have to convene them, but just having the threat of them potentially being convened should be enough to get the existing courts going the line properly. And is that across the country, or do you have to like fight in every province to get this? I you end up having to fight in every province, although it gets easier every time you win. Really? really? It's a precedent? Yeah, precedent. And once, once they know that you can do it, they yeah. go, okay, he's going to win. Those are dominoes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Anyone else? <laughs> 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 and all the things that you send out, how do you know who to send what? When I did mine, I sat down and I made a list of everyone who could potentially be affected. I started with the queen, and I ended with the dog catcher's mom. <laughs> so it's up to you to make that list, figure out who's going to be affected, send it to them. Yeah, one more. Yeah, just from what I was in the guy from your, 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 your lectures, that you're, challenging, you're going to go to court to challenge a judge seeking at a precedent. <coughs> No, I'm, I'm seeking a judicial determination, standard judicial determination. In order to hire peace officers? No, in order to, I, I don't need their permission to do it, no. but I want the police, the existing police, to recognize that we're operating on our rights. Okay. 
And if we just go try doing it, just because you have a right to do something doesn't mean it is right to do it, especially if you know it's going to generate conflict. So I'm mean, seeking to avoid that generation of conflict by going to the judge and saying, come on, show me where it says we can't do this, or simply acknowledge it doesn't say it. And we're not going to ask him, okay, now come to, now rule that we do have that right. You don't give them that power because then that's when they start bringing in their own ideology and making shit up. Um, yeah, and just, uh, so when's that going to happen and where can we get like follow-up information on that uh, trial? Uh, probably trial? next week or the week after I'm going to be doing it. I've got a, a show in London on Saturday, so I'm not going to be able to do it this week. And the next week I've got to go visit my dad in Windsor, so I don't know that I'll be able to do it then. Right. Week after I'm in Niagara Falls, and I was hoping to do it down near Halifax or down near uh, Hamilton. So it's probably a little ways down the road. Before then, I do have your emails. What I can do is send you uh, some PDF copies of the action and what <coughs> you guys can look at it, realize what I'm what I'm doing with it. And then there are documents there that you can, or the notice that you can sign. And you can even take it to all your friends and say, hey, come on, sign this, so that I can get, you know, 500, 1,000 signatures. Okay. One more. <laughs> you. No? Okay. You mentioned the Canadian Equity Act, or sorry, the Law and Equity Act. Law, Law and Equity Act is in BC. Yes. Is there an alternative or equivalent in Ontario? I do not know. So we have to require to uh, identification in Canada? Uh, from what I understand, you're born with neither name nor identification and you have no obligation to have either. You are not obliged to have government issued ID and therefore you cannot be obliged to produce it. Just prepare to go to jail. <laughs> well, that's why I have a fee schedule in place. Let them throw me in jail, I'll be collecting on that. And you can, uh, when they say identify yourself, fine, myself, uh, I'm wrong. So you don't try to hide, but if they say, well, I need you to, I need to see government issued ID. Well, I need to see evidence that I have an obligation to have it. And yes, they might try to play tough with you and say, I'm going to throw you in jail and intimidate you. Stand your ground. Say, bring me before a JP right now. And if there is no obligation in Canada to have government issued ID, that you're arresting me for not producing something I don't have. And then you, you bring charges to bear against him. Oftentimes they'll try to do a little bit of intimidation and bluff. Uh, yeah, uh, is the Liberty Bell a good idea? I'm not that familiar with it. From what I understand, I think it would work better in the States than here because trying to get something like that up and running here requires you to get some angry people together. And I don't see our remedy as being an, an angry type thing. Well, how, how it works is if somebody gets pulled over, right, there's a number that they're supposed to call. And then that number is like a switchboard, and then they disperse to the people in the area of that, right, that victim on the side of the road so that they all go there with the cameras and record what's going on. That's not a bad idea, but I prefer to see that happening where we call our own peace officers and suddenly a bunch of C-3PO come in and start <laughs> looking at this cop saying, go ahead, cross the line, we arrest you the moment you do. Nice. Don't you need a bond to do that? Not, not really. Uh, you, people who are hired by the existing <coughs> corporations and whatnot, those corporations need to have them bonded. But you don't mean to be bonded to be a peace officer. It, but the definition of the criminal code does not mention bonded at all. No, I mean to make, to make an arrest. No. Nope. Nothing that says that you need a bond to make an arrest. The, uh, the municipal police departments, like their police officers bonded, if they're dealing with the public, because that covers their acts. But if you're willing to operate uh, accepting liability for your actions, you don't need a bond at all. Plus, we're free men. We're trying to avoid getting away. We're, we're escaping this status of bonded. If you make an arrest and the police officer is different as a citizen's arrest, then you wouldn't use that term? No, I wouldn't arrest? use the arrest. Yeah. I wouldn't use the term citizen's arrest. Does that sound good? Yeah. One more? I, I'm very new to this whole thing, so I, I wasn't familiar with this uh, fee structure you just referred to. The fee schedule essentially is you tell them how much you, you generally make and what your, your um, it's kind of like a menu. 
saying if you want to arrest me and you place me under arrest, my fee schedule is X amount of dollars per hour. What you're doing is you're creating the terms of a contract so that when they do come and impose upon you, you can tell them, listen, you activated my fee schedule and I served you notice of it before. <coughs> Have you ever been successful with them? Yes. Well, does that need to be noticed? I, I didn't collect the money, but I was in a position to do so. And then I told them, well, you get one. I'm not going to collect on this one. Oh, thank you very much. And then that put great big red flags all over my name on their computer. And instead of them getting you know, mad at me and trying to come after me, they recognize, oh, this guy was cool to us once. And so they're, they're cooler back. And that's on the individual itself. So. Yeah. yeah. And, but I have heard tell of people who have had enormous success with a fee schedule. One guy who did it in a, a court in, in the States, and he had his hat on, and the bailiff came and ordered him to remove his headdress. And he said, is that an order? And the guy said, yeah, that's an order. He said, fine. I'm obeying your order, here's my bill. And I gave him a bill for a thousand bucks. And the bailiff, of course, full of himself, he's laughing at it. So he takes it up to the judge. Hey, judge, look at what this idiot gave me. Uh -huh. There's a little bit of whispering. The bailiff looked back at the guy, apparently, and he walked out of there with a check for a thousand bucks. Otherwise, that bailiff would have been faced a charge of fraud. You can't place an order on your fellow man in a common law jurisdiction and simply not be liable for some form of bill. We're all equal. What's the process of doing that when you're not in court? Uh, for what, collecting? Yep. The same way you would serve any invoice on any other organization. Just assume that you provided a service, you had previously told them what the cost of these services was, you've provided it, now it's time for you to pay up, and you send them a bill. You say, here's my bill, pay up. It's the exact same process that you would use as a contractor to get paid from someone who will see so you, you just send in by registered mail so you don't know some of your invoice book on I have one on you. Yeah. Just yeah. walk right in there? Well, it's a little bit. Chances are they'll reject it right off the bat. They might laugh at it. Yeah. And that's why you then go to a notary public and say, yeah, and that my, this presentment of my bill is being dishonored. I'd like you to witness it. So you have to study, uh, I'm not going to be talking in the next 20 minutes about how the process is the collecting the bill is. But you can easily look it up. Okay, folks, that's my time. Thank you so much.